Thank you. Thanks a lot, Emily. I'm not so sure I like this big giant picture of me up on the stage while I'm talking. It seems a little Orwellian, but um, I'm delighted to be here. I will let you know uh, I'm actually here to recruit you. I have a lot of supporters here in the first row that have put me up to that, but the fact of the matter is I've been walking around the show, I've been talking to a number of you, and the number of innovations and business models and interesting opportunities are such that I'm convinced that your talent is what we need at ICANN. Now, a lot of the businesses that you represent and a lot of the businesses that support your business depend on the domain name system, the DNS, the system of unique identifiers of the internet. And you likely know that these are coordinated by ICANN, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. But you may not know a lot about ICANN. When I joined, well, before I joined, which is about three and a half years ago, occasionally I would read about ICANN in a mainstream publication, and I would picture some stately columned building, maybe on the shores of Lake Geneva, where five or six wise men with beards and suits, men that looked like Vint Cerf, so sort of clones of Vint Cerf, maybe sat around a quiet room and decided the future of the internet addressing system. It's not like that. I went to my first ICANN meeting. It was in Dakar, Senegal. We were 100, uh, 1,100 people. We were crammed into a pretty hot tent. And it was part of the ICANN meeting that's known as the public forum, which is a little bit like open mic night. So you have about 1,000 people in a room. People get up to the microphone and they talk to the ICANN community, ICANN board of directors, and a very passionate Argentinian guy got to the microphone in Senegal and complained about the country code name for the Falkland Islands being inaccurate because the islands were actually called the Malvinas Islands and belonged to Argentina, so it shouldn't be .fk. And I was sitting in this hot tent in Africa thinking, wow, this is a really interesting job. So uh, fast forward to where we are now. If you came to our recent meeting in Singapore, you'll know that we're getting about 3,000 people at an ICANN meeting. These happen three times a year. About 165 countries are represented. About 150 governments turn up. Argentina, the UK turns up. Russia, India, they're all there. Companies like yours. There are some wise men in suits and beards as well, and some civil society activists in their Birkenstocks and people in national dress. And at our last Singapore meeting, we had 300 sessions discussing innovations and developments in the domain name system. And so it's not at all tranquil or stately or calm. It's a little bit like controlled chaos. It's a multi-stakeholder, multi-equal stakeholder environment where you all can have a say. So I'm curious, in the audience, have many of you been to an ICANN meeting? Hold up your hands if you've been to an ICANN meeting. That's a great number. How about if you've been to another internet standard setting body, like the IETF or the WC3? Okay. And so I guess the rest of you are free riders then, right? Because you're benefiting from these, the hard work of the people that raise their hands, and I hope that you're building impressive and wonderful businesses that are successful on these resources that this community helps develop. So just to name a few, uh, everybody here knows about new generic top-level domains. Uh, this is probably the big topic of the day at ICANN now since I joined. 618 new top-level domains are now alongside the existing 22 that we had before in the generic space. So I know dot .green is in the house. We, I've seen dot .club is here. We have dot .design, which just launched. And we're seeing how this has increased competition and choice and more space and more opportunities. And this is something that was developed over the course of seven years by the multi-stakeholder community that I just described. A really interesting part of this program is also something called internationalized domain names. We call them IDNs. Now these are domain names that are in Mandarin or Arabic or Cyrillic or Devangali or other alphabets, which are the alphabets, by the way, most of the world will be using. Between now and 2025, we're gonna go from the three billion of us who are connected to each other on the internet to nearly five billion of us. And if you look at just at India alone, they will double the number of internet users to 550 million. 
And guess what? Most of them use an alphabet other than the Latin or ASCII script. So if you're looking for your next billion customers, you may want to know about internationalized domain names, and you may want to know how to deploy them to build your business. There are some technical developments at ICANN. We promote DNSSEC, Domain Name Security Extensions. I've heard a lot of talk about that in the show. Um, certainly IPv6, we join with our fellow internet bodies to promote IPC, IPv6, so I know that you've all deployed DNSSEC and you're all IPv6 enabled, <laughs> correct? <laughs> yes. Um, so these are the things that ICANN is working on. So if you're thinking to yourself, wow, I never knew that ICANN did all this, guess what? You're the ones that I want to recruit. And why do we need you? We need you because these developments result in important both technical and policy debates where we need your brains and we need your talent. Some of them relate to the IDNs I mentioned earlier. So internationalized domain names, guess what? The software and hardware that you use in your systems and your businesses they may not work with these new scripts and these new domain names, or even just generic names themselves. In the applications for the new generic top-level domains, the prize for the longest name applied for uh, was a tie, 18 letters, travelers, dot travelers insurance and dot Northwestern Mutual. So there's something about insurance companies that are very comfortable with very long domain names, but they may or may not work technically with the systems that are in place now. There are even thornier and more protracted discussions on things like who is, which many of you will know, refers to the data that is maintained on people that register domain names and websites. Now, it's the bedrock of e-commerce. If you're looking to find out who's counterfeiting your goods or if you're in law enforcement and you need to find out who's behind a website that's doing something abusive or illegal, you want more of that information available, knowing who's behind a particular registration. However, if you're a dissident or a blogger or a human rights activist in a repressive part of the world, the kind of people that Emily hangs out with on a regular basis, you might want less of that information available. And even as we speak, there is a working group at ICANN that's discussing privacy and proxy uh, accreditations. And you can go online, and you can read the proposal, and you can lend your voice. If you're selling domain names, the outcome will affect your business. Similarly, we get a lot of scrutiny lately on something uh, related to our contractual compliance enforcement. You may see particularly in the intellectual property community, those people that are advocates of strong intellectual property rights feel that ICANN should be doing more or working harder to enforce compliance throughout the distribution the chain of, com of domain names. It's a classic case of a distributed diffuse distribution chain that we can only affect through the compliance uh, enforcement of our contracts. But guess what? Those very same contracts are developed together with the community in open consultation with registries and registrars and law enforcement and civil rights activists and people from the intellectual property community. So the next time that those contracts are up for discussion, you will want to be at the table if you have an interest in this debate. So I hope by now that I've convinced you that some of the things that are discussed at ICANN are important to your business. And I hope that we can find a way to um, incorporate you in our work. I'll be very happy to connect you with the different committees and working groups that work on these things. We have heroes among us. There are some people in this room who run successful businesses and at the same time devote a few hours, sometimes many hours, to the work of ICANN from which we all benefit. And I'm very grateful for them and we all should be as well. I'm going to close just to mention an important historical moment for ICANN. 17 years ago when the Clinton administration set up ICANN, they set it up as a private sector-led multi-stakeholder organization. And because it was really just a few people in a room passing around the hat to pay for their lunch money, they put in place a contract with the Commerce Department. It's a no-fee, largely symbolic contract, but just to show that the U.S. government stood behind this new organization. And now, 17 years later, fast forward to last year, the Commerce Department said it's time to let, let it go. 
Let It Go. It's the theme song from the movie Frozen, and it's the Commerce Department's theme for transitioning what's called the IANA function, the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority, to the multi-stakeholder community. The IANA includes the protocol parameters, the domain names, and the IP numbers, and the other identifiers that keep the Internet a single system. And the conditions that the U.S. government put in place were that whatever follows this contract should be supportive of multi-stakeholderism, assure the security and stability and resilience of the Internet, keep the Internet open, be accepted by the global community, and not be a government-led solution or an intergovernmental-led solution. So our community rose to the occasion, and there are proposals out there now. You can go onto ICANN.org. In fact, I'll wait while you go onto ICANN.org. You can download the proposal. It's only 147 pages. There's a summary. But literally, it's as easy as going to that and reading it and weighing in with your opinion to let us know what you think of the future of the IANA functions, of which you're either a customer or dependent on customers, or ICANN's accountability mechanisms and governance structures, which are also the subject to community work that's going on right now. So I would be delighted if this opportunity for you is like your gateway drug to start commenting on ICANN work, maybe signing up for a working group. There are people here who have survived them. As the Vice President for Stakeholder Engagement, I encourage you to join us. I hope I can recruit passionate, talented people like you to participate in our work. Thank you very much. <laughs> the picture's still up there. So you have double. <laughs> so thank you so much. I thought that was really good and really clear. And sometimes I, I notice a lot when I go to internet conferences, sometimes there's confusion about ICANN, and I think that was actually a very good explanation about what's happening there. And I'd actually like to ask you to sort of break it down even further. You talked about the IANA transformation. You know, you kind of explained the historical root of that. But could you break down a little further how it's actually going to play out? Because I'm sure some of you have seen in the media, there's been a bit of a debate about this, right? Some people say, this isn't a big deal, it's, it's a nominal change, nothing's really going to affect us in some dramatic way. And then you see these scaremongering pieces saying the US is giving up control of the internet and China and Russia are gonna take over. <laughs> you know, I, I've seen both sides of the argument. So I, I'd be really grateful if you could break down just like what does it actually mean? I mean, how, how is this gonna play out and, and are we giving up control to other countries? Uh, th thanks for asking the question. The, the, the scaremongering is a great term because you do see some really um, alarmist headlines and sound bites. Um, you know, I didn't really go into this too much when I was talking, but the uh, multi-stakeholder community has been administering ICANN's work and the IANA for these 17 years mm -hmm. without interruption. And for most people in this room and most users of the internet, they will notice no difference from one day to the next after the Commerce Department's contract expires. And breaking it down to the work that's being done right now, as I said, there was a, there's a community that really worked in terms of how IANA should work operationally after the Commerce Department steps away. And then there's another group that is looking at ICANN's governance structures and accountability mm -hmm. and looking at things like is it susceptible to capture, whether by corporations or hostile governments or intergovernmental mm -hmm. organizations? Now, ironically, the existence of this symbolic contract increasingly is pointed to by a lot of governments to say, you know what? We think the US government is secretly calling the shots. Mm -hmm. We don't really believe that it's a multi-stakeholder organization, or else why do you need this contract? Now, if you've been to an ICANN meeting, you know, no, it's very hard. Uh, you can't imagine anybody secretly calling the shots mm -hmm. of anything. Um, it is very multi-stakeholder-y and very internet-y. But increasingly, I'm hearing, even from CEOs of tech companies that are trying to do global deals, or people in the administration that are trying to negotiate trade agreements, that a lot of governments say, you know, US, when are you gonna give up the secret control of the internet? Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, we have this very symbolic kind of no-fee contract that's been in place as sort of a backstop for many years. 
and it, it, there, it will make no difference to let it go, but it will relieve, relieve a lot of pressure from those governments that say, maybe the United Nations should run some aspects of the domain name system, maybe the ITU should take over some sort of internet addressing. So if the process goes poorly, ironically, that's what will play into the hands of these governments that will then take these votes to the UN. If the process goes well, it strengthens the hand of all of the more, I would say, free market, liberal democracies and the countries in the middle that are looking for leaders to show that the US means what it says, that they believe a private sector, multi-stakeholder led model works best for the world. So is there any scenario, any worst case nightmare scenario in which some sort of oppressive government uses this transformation in order to exert more control over the internet? I ask because there really is a lot of speculation. To, is there, and, and I, I, I hear what you're saying, that you're saying that's very unlikely, but is it possible? Could that happen? Well, I think that the risk is that there's a, either increased friction or fragmentation, and this mm -hmm. could occur in really two ways and two venues. On the one hand, this is a really important year for internet diplomacy. Ten years ago, uh, Kofi Annan, the UN Secretary General, convened the World Summit on the Information Society. The internet was still considered pretty young, and in true UN fashion, the UN got together to see how this would help, uh, the internet could help the world in terms of development, in terms of humanity, in terms of human progress. And so this is the year that they're going to do a 10 year review to see how has the internet done for the whole world. Mm -hmm. Now I talked to some business people and they kind of roll their eyes and they say, really, we're supposed to, we're being graded on how well the internet has served humanity, but that's what the UN does. And so a number of countries are gonna look at things like what's happened in the developing world, what's happened with access. Um, and if they still feel that the deck is not even, is stacked against them or that the US has some sort of a special role, they're gonna take those votes to the UN and say, let's change the government governance structure. The other thing that could happen, and you see a lot of fragmentation in terms of firewalls and content controls and things that happen on the internet. And luckily, what ICANN does is a little insulated from that because it's one layer lower. It's mm -hmm. the logical interoperability, the logical layer of the internet. Now, some countries have said, well, we have the cap capability to do our own internet with our own addressing system right. and make it completely separate. Mm -hmm. I think that they probably calculated that the network benefit is better than the cost of mm -hmm. breaking the internet, but some people talk to that kind of fragmentation as a risk. and so. The transition should build trust in the system, and the trust in the system should relieve some of those pressures. Right, interesting. Well, thank you, that's very helpful. And I just, I guess part of this is stems from the fact that there's less trust in the US right now because of various. Oh, well, there's less trust in the world. I yeah. mean, people, you know, you think about the internet and you think about it as a group of people that really knew each other. They knew their, you know, the, uh, the DNS was a notebook that a man named John Pastel kept in his pocket. And it was, you know, here's my friend Christian, and he's at Stanford, and he's got this computer with this number. And so it grew from a book that is a notebook in a pocket to a book that was about like this. It took like 10 years to get this big. And now you can imagine all of the different addresses, the many billions of IP addresses and the hundreds of millions of uh, names. And so to maintain trust, it's actually, the internet is so well designed, it's scaled so fast that it took people by surprise. It took governments by surprise. It took dictators by surprise. We hear stories of presidents pounding the desk and calling their poor staffer in and saying, who runs this internet? How did it get here? <laughs> Call, get the internet on the phone. And so the, the, the point you raise about trust is really important in a world where there's geopolitical considerations, there's declining trust in institutions, even in the United States. And I would say also, too, going back to your scaremongering comment, you know, it's easy for people to try to get attention with scary sound bites. And so what I'm describing doesn't really fit into a sound bite. But the irony is, well, twofold. If you ever see a headline that has the word control and internet together, it just doesn't compute because the internet was really designed specifically to be not controlled, free from control. 
And then um, secondly, you know, a, sound, a, a sound bite is a very hard thing to combat. The irony right. is we're not giving anything away to anybody. We're actually insulating it from attempts to take it over. Right. Well, I think that's true. And I think the problem is, is that for these mainstream media sound bites, most people don't actually understand how ICANN functions. So it's much easier to just say the US is giving away the internet to Russia. And you know, <laughs> that's going to get a lot more attention. So. Um, great. So let's move on to some other questions. Um, so how do ICANN governance and stakeholder arrangements overall affect internet infrastructure providers? Well, you know, for most of the groups here, there are, there are some uh, constituency groups that they would directly plug into. Um, I know there are a couple of representatives here from uh, the internet service providers. There is the, um, the business constituency. There are places to plug in to affect policy and really raise ideas. Um, so that's the one point that I also wanted to make is that ICANN policies don't just happen to you and they don't just happen to your company. They actually come from suggestions from people like you. And every once in a while we talk to companies that are in the infrastructure, working in infrastructure, and they're kind of annoyed with us. And they say, you know, every time ICANN comes, we hear some new standard that we have to implement or some new, you know, security feature that we have to become compliant with. And I can understand that frustration. We seem like a big cost center, cost center to them or cause of cost to them. So it's important for people like me that are in business engagement to go out and say, look, please, if you start the process earlier, you can raise your hand earlier and you can say, look, this is how it will affect my business. But some of the mentions that I made in my earlier statements about DNSSEC mm -hmm. or universal acceptance and compatibility issues of generic top-level domains are ways that these companies are being affected by our work. So can you maybe talk a little bit more specifically about how providers can sort of take part in ICANN's decision-making process or in, in yeah. discussions? It's, you know, I will tell you, Emily, it's an area that we could do better in. Um, there is, uh, you talked about learning how ICANN works, and there is a learning curve. There's, it's very acronym heavy. Um, <laughs> People are experts, but experts in different things. So if this gives anybody any comfort, we have a lot of very deeply technical people, but we have a lot of people that are trained as, I'm trained as an economist. We have lawyers. We have people that were formerly in government and policy. We have a lot of business people, a lot of strategy people. Um, and so they all get together, and it's a big cross-cultural communication exercise. We can work to um, make the learning curve a little bit less steep, but also with partners. There are people here. There's Graham from Hover is here, and he represents registrars in the registrar constituency group. He will gladly talk to you about some of the work he does at ICANN and explain how you can become involved. We have Christian Dawson here, the I2 Coalition. He's largely responsible for getting me here because he knows that ICANN's work really is vital to what you all do. And you have the skills and the eyes and the ears to know what the future of the marketplace is going to demand of ICANN. So currently, the answer is you can sign up for a working group. You can just sign up for a newsletter to know when there are open public comment periods. Or you can join an actual constituency group, either as a business, an ISP, or some other part of the ecosystem. And what are some of the risks of providers not being at the table? I mean, why should providers get involved in these conversations? I think largely it goes back to what I said about companies feeling taken by surprise when it comes to cost or adopting, adopting their networks and systems, hardware and software, to some of the new developments in the DNS. So it helps them to not be taken by surprise. There's a much more strategic play, though, too, which is if you really think about it, you know, it may take a long time to get your ideas through the consensus bottom-up building process. But if you see something that's visionary and that will benefit your company, your marketplace, the world that's a change or an addition to the domain names or, IP or internet addressing system, you can get that into the mix. There also is, you know, for people, I find that security is increasingly a topic at, uh, at shows like this. And we have a very strong um, security and stability advisory community. Um, we also have a tech day where people come to the ICANN public meetings, which you can attend remotely, by the way. 
and you can just learn what's on the minds of other companies like yours. So it's a little bit of avoid surprises that may be costly, learn from others like you about what they're focused on and what may be coming around the corner, or to be really strategic and visionary, get your ideas for the future into the mix. That's good. I think you've summed up a lot, a lot of these <laughs> follow-up questions. Um, I actually want to just zoom back out for a second to some of the issues we were talking out before, about before. And this actually isn't an ICANN-specific question. This is more of a general question. But do you think that the internet is moving in a more fragmented direction? I mean, that's a big conversation that people are having, you know, where they talk about And again, this isn't specific to ICANN. This is just sort of a more general trend that, you know, China is trying to have its own internet and other countries are trying to have its own internet. Do you see, do you see that as something that is really something that we need to be concerned about? Or is this even a trend at all? This idea, you know, people refer to it as the balkanization of the internet. Yeah, my friends from Macedonia and... <laughs> don't like that. They don't like it when I have yeah. Serbian friends don't like balkanization, but it's a good term. <laughs> um, you know, I, we're in a little bit of a race. So mm -hmm. when I talked about these stakeholders coming together and learning from each other, mm -hmm. Um, and I talked about those dictators or even just friendly chancellors of countries in the middle of Europe pounding the table and saying, who's running this internet? We need an internet for Germany, mm -hmm. as Angela Merkel said. You know, those of you that are in this business, you know that, that uh, economically and technologically, it makes no sense to think about a Brazilian internet or a German internet or data localization or, you know, it just, goes against really all of the benefits of the global unitary internet. And yet, the number of people that understand the technical underpinnings of the internet and then can convey that to people that are leading countries or that are members of parliament or that are in Congress, mm -hmm. um, this is really what we need more of. I will tell you, we find them at ICANN. You find people who can bridge that debate and more and more countries and governments are coming to see multi-stakeholder approaches in action. So last year there was a meeting in Brazil that Dilma Rousseff convened, you know, just after she had been at the Uni United Nations saying, oh, you know, this, this internet thing, the UN needs to be in charge because we don't know who's running the show. Well, the CEO of ICANN went and parked outside her door and said, you have a very vibrant internet stakeholder community in Brazil, you should learn from them. And so she convened this meeting called Net Mundial, where governments, technical community, civil society, and business got into a room on equal footing in a room like this with a document to negotiate. And they each had a different microphone where they would line up. And the governments at first said, well, we don't line up at microphones. We open the meeting because we're the governments. And everyone said, no, 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 that's not how it works. That this way, the way it works is we all get around the table together. Mm -hmm. And guess what? It was a successful outcome. Brazil was very happy. A lot of countries, were dem it was demonstrated to them that we can all get along. It built trust. And so I think there, at least for those people that have touched this model, ICANN's model, they're less afraid and they're running less into the kind of balkanization, fragmentation mm -hmm. mode that I think that you were asking about. Well, it seems to me also that part of this issue, you know, some of these efforts on the part of governments for data localization or to, you know, build their own internet does stem from distrust of the United States, right? Which, uh, especially with all the revelations about the NSA, and I think, as you were saying, some of the pressure on ICANN, you know, the U.S. is secretly controlling this process, is also rooted in that same distrust of the United States when it comes to the internet. And um, I just, I know this is a big question, but, and, and maybe, maybe the transformation happening at ICANN is a step in the right direction, but what are some of the other things that the U.S. could do to restore trust? I mean, in, in the U.S., in, well, because that it's, seems it's, like that's a big part of this, this it's, story. It's a tall order, and it's really not for me to comment on what the leaders in the U.S. should do. I think there are amazing leaders in the internet community in the U.S. Um, people like Jimmy Wales mm -hmm. or people like Vince Cerf or others who have worked, served in private sector, nonprofit sector, government, and they have ver been very good about being very vocal and reaching out across borders. I think that it's not necessarily something that the U.S. government is in a position to do. That I think right, if yeah. they lead with the broader community of stakeholders and say, look, don't take it from us, 
take it from all these people who develop the internet, people like you who are benefiting from the internet economically, people like you who are doing business. I mean, I've met people from about six different countries here, and the seamlessness with which people are doing business is amazing to me. So if we can convey that to our elected leaders and to governments o over around the world, I think that that will help a little bit with the trust. No, I think you're right. I mean, I think there definitely are actions that can be taken at the industry level, and it's not only a US government thing. So that's a, that's a good response. Um, so sort of on that same note, what advice would you give to a global public policy director at a dynamic internet company, um, you know, a company that wants to provide services all over the world? What kind of advice would you give to one of these directors who wants to establish productive relations with governments and regulators? Because it sort of gets to your point that sometimes diplomacy is being conducted <laughs> right. by these internet companies, not necessarily by the US government. So right. how should these companies deal with regulators? How should they deal with governments? And how should they deal with, in particular, challenging governments? Yeah. I think that there's going to be a great demand for people with that particular the skill set that can kind of bridge policy and technology. You know, and I have no illusions. The people in this room, I think you're largely in sales and business development, and that's great. And I also know that a lot of you are probably running very lean machines and you don't really have a policy shop. You might have a legal department or a compliance group. Um, but, you know, send them a note now and ask them to look into some of these standard setting bodies like ICANN. Um, I would say if you're, if you're lucky enough to be a company that can hire a policy person mm. like the person you're describing, I would say you don't, have to, you don't have to get deeply involved in the work of ICANN, but you have to follow it enough to understand what a multi-equal stakeholder approach mm -hmm. is, that it's not complying with regulation that just happens to you, it's showing up and helping to shape the future voluntary rules by which the internet really works. There are other, um, you know, a benefit of it is it's kind of a safe space. So government people and representatives come to that to learn from people like us. Another safe space is the Internet Governance Forum, which happens, there's one globally every year. Uh, the next one's in Brazil in November. But there are many national and regional and local ones. There's one in the United States in Washington uh, taking place in July. And again, this is another safe space where government leaders and elected officials and even regulators, they don't necessarily like to admit in front of a room or in front of their staffs that they don't really understand how the internet works. Mm -hmm. So you have to seek out these fora and help educate them and also learn what their pressures are, mm -hmm. what their public policy mandates are. They are in a tough spot. So if I were advising somebody like you that you mentioned, I would try to get them into the fora where they can have that kind of a exchange. Yeah, it's inter it's a really tough question because I think you know Jimmy Wells spoke about it a, a little bit this morning too, talking about the challenges of Wikipedia in a country like China, for example. And this is this is these are the tougher questions, right, that the U.S. companies face when when they're dealing with countries with very different regulatory environments, and they have to. To stay in that country, they have to comply with the laws of that country, but then they also have to answer to people in the United States. So, right. Well, and let me tell you, I will say that the um, if you take China as an example, China recently sent their senior ranking internet authority to an ICANN meeting. To uh, it was last June, and he stood up and he said, "Look, we un it took us a while, but we understand the multi-stakeholder model. We support it." We support the work of ICANN. We believe that gives China a seat at the table and we'll do our best to contribute. Now this happens again, as I mentioned, at the logical layer of the internet, the interoperable layer, and I think that that's the calculation that we all wanna be on one internet, that the importance of each of us being to, able to connect with the other three billion, or the two billion, nine billion, hundred mm -hmm. million, is really important. A lot of people then ask about what happens on the internet at the next layer. Right. So it's content, it's firewalls, it's censorship, it's child protection, it's spam, it's all of these things. And these are, above, these are beyond the remit of really the standards bodies that I'm talking about. The Internet Governance Forum talks about them to do knowledge sharing, but nobody's really coming up with solutions there. Right. But 
I think that the experience of these last few decades of, of coordinating the technical resources in a multi-stakeholder way bodes well for convening stakeholders to talk about those other thorny issues that are on the internet. Mm -hmm. And so as long as it, ICANN keeps the underpinning working, um, we're very happy to lend advice to people that want to try to approach this you know, conflict of laws or conflict mm -hmm. of jurisdiction or different approaches to what's legal and what's uh, you know, free speech or not, for example. Um, I think multi-stakeholder with business government, technology people to tell you what's even technologically feasible, mm -hmm. and the civil society, uh, wherever they come from, in a, in a room is the way to go. Definitely, definitely. Um, let's see, what else? We don't have too much more time. Um, what are the most important decisions that ICANN will make in the next years that will strongly affect hosters and cloud providers? What do you see looking forward? We've talked about some of the big historic decisions, but what do you see as some of the future developments that will most affect the people in this room? You know, I, you can t you know anybody who's technical can tell that I'm not technical. I was once asked to address the North American Network Operators Group about name collisions and new generic top-level domains. <laughs> And I had 10 minutes to do it, and I asked some of my more technical colleagues, and they said, so you have 10 minutes for your talk, right? And I said, yes. Okay. And they said, make sure you use up all the time so you don't get any questions, because they will murder you. Anyway, anyone who's here that's technical knows I'm not technical, but there will be technical developments, like the universal acceptance. Um, there is something called name collision, which I encourage you to look into, and the community is working on that. It's not ICANN really that makes the decisions, it's the community right. bottom up process. Um, and then some of the other items that I mentioned in terms of like privacy and proxy uh, services, this who is in terms of uh, the availability and the maintenance of that information. I think that that's, um, those developments are some of those that will most affect some of the companies that are here. Great, I, and speaking of questions that will destroy you, <laughs> let's take some from the audience. Oh dear, oh dear. <laughs> um, so Does anybody have any questions that will test his technical ability? <laughs> um, if not, I can ask I, one I final question. I do have a see. I do have a secret technical colleague who I've planted in the audience who can help me. <laughs> um, any questions? Anything you always wanted to ask? I can. Now you have a chance. And listen, it could be a complaint too. It doesn't need to, I'm, I, you know, a part of my role at, as stakeholder engagement is not just to recruit you and brainwash you on how wonderful ICANN is. It's really also to listen to your concerns. And there are a lot of concerns. So if you have anything that you've always wanted to get off your chest, um, feel free to do that too. Hey, Chris, uh, it's Graham. Uh, this isn't really a question, but actually a, more of the recruitment bit. Uh, hey, also. Uh, I work for Hover, we're a registrar, um, and I am the registrar representative on the IANA transition, so if you sell domain names and you care about that, you should come talk to me because we're looking for all the input we can get. Uh, and the other one is, it was mentioned privacy and proxy accreditation, if you sell domain names and you sell privacy services, the changes to that business are going to affect you if you have questions on that. I'm the uh, co-chair of that working group, so I know lots about it, and you should come talk to me as well. Uh, that's all. Uh, you want the mic, Dawson? <laughs> You've got no questions. You just get comments. I'll do the same thing. I'll do the other half of, of what you were doing. Since, uh, so my name is Christian Dawson, and I am president of Servant and chair of the I2 Coalition. I uh, had no clue what I can even did a few years ago. I've now gone to eight meetings, and I've made it through the acronym SOUP, understand it, and I'm pretty heavily involved. Um, one of the things I'm involved in is name collisions that he talked about, and another thing that it is, uh, I'm actually vice chair of the Universal Acceptance Steering Group. Uh, both are things that if you're interested in, you can come talk to me about, but just if you're interested in getting involved in ICANN, and you have no idea how to even start uh, making, parsing the language of ICANN, I can give you some tips on that too, too. so reach out to me. Um, so we only have 30 more seconds, but I really need to ask this question because it says here that you swam across the Amazon River. 
and I'd really like you to explain <laughs> what that uh, means <laughs> okay, before we leave. Somebody must have done some very deep Googling to get to that. I mean, you must have been on like the seventh O in the Google <laughs> to get to that. Um, I, was a I was a young diplomat serving in Colombia. I traveled around the country quite a bit, and I was right at that point where Peru and Brazil and Colombia meet, and I was uh, on the Colombia side, and I said, well, I'm going to swim to Peru, and I checked. Um, piranhas are only uh, eating humans during the dry season, and it was the rainy <laughs> season, so there was plenty for the piranhas to eat besides me. Now, the rainy season meant that the river was wider, but I was safer, and How so How long did I it take swim. you to do? It was just, you know, from one side of a river to another. It was, I could see it. I mean, it was less than a mile, I think. So. Anyway, well, thank you very much. And thank you for the useful <laughs> piranha the warning. Because <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you.